Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. We are back again with Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. I did a video last year walking through my favorite companions that are available no matter what you do. I'd like to revisit that list while also including all the companions who can join you due to mythic quests, romances, or quest resolutions. Before we begin, there are four things I'd like to note. First, just about all of the companions are fantastic. You can have a really good time even with those ranked towards the bottom of the list. Second, because all the companions are fantastic, opinions about which ones are best vary widely. Feel free to let me know down in the comments that this list is trash and why your personal list is vastly superior. Third, please keep in mind that I am going through all the potential party members, which means this video will have spoilers. If you want to avoid that, now is the time to go ahead and check out. Finally, I am aware that Through the Ashes gives you two party members, but they will not be part of this list as I do not believe the comparison would make sense. With all that out the way, let's get started. All the way at the bottom of the list, Number 23 is the Skeletal Champion. You can only get this creature if you are a Lich, but he will automatically join your party at Mythic Rank 3. He has no quest, there is no reactivity to him in the game, and he never speaks. You also do not have direct control over his build. Instead, as your Mythic Ranks increase, his power will also increase, allowing you to choose from a variety of templates that will automatically select feats and spells for him. Outside of Marksman, I found the majority of these templates to be underwhelming and never really felt like I had control over the champion's development. Number 22 is Delamir. She is a Lich Companion that you can recruit in Act 3. When you initially revive her, there is a pretty cool dialogue about some of her history and the fact she strongly dislikes being your slave. Unfortunately, outside of this conversation, she has the least reactivity compared to all the other Lich party members. Her only saving grace is that her class is Slayer, with no weird feat choices, so she can become a very deadly archer, but not one that's particularly better compared to Lan, Arushale, or Windwalk. Outside of that, she is virtually invisible. Number 21 is Undead Queen Galfrey. You can only recruit her if you kill and revive her as an undead in Act 5. Once revived, instead of being a paladin, she becomes a Thundercaller, which is a bard subclass that I personally found to be mediocre. Her respec option only takes you to level 16, so you are pretty much stuck with this build. The real issue, however, is that there is not nearly enough reactivity to have a freaking Queen Galfrey on your team. When you first revive her, you can engage in a conversation that is deeply satisfying. She can be convinced that life is better this way, and Iomade never truly cared about her. After this, there is little to no additional dialogue, and other NPCs in the world don't react to what you have done. So Seo makes no attempt to stop you from killing her, and doesn't turn against you until after returning to Dresden. That Dresden scene is basically the same one all mythic paths get after killing Galfrey. The most frustrating part in all of this is that there is zero reaction from Iomade. She reacts with righteous fury twice if you choose to become the swarm, but has no reaction whatsoever to you permanently enslaving her greatest champion. All of that really cheapens the experience of having her and lowers the value of this character. Number 20 is Stalton Vane, and Liches can recruit him in Act 3. His build is absolutely terrible, and arguably the worst out of all your potential party members. He is a war priest, which is a mediocre class, and he has a list of feats that are very inconsistent. Mind you, Stalton is known for making horrendous choices, so I think the build fits his character very well. He suffers from the same issue all Lich party members have in that he almost never speaks. For whatever reason, undead party members never banter with each other, never have camp dialogue, and very rarely react verbally to anything in the game. 
All of them except Char speak at least once, so it's not like being undead prevents them from conversating. Like Galfrey, Stalin is a well-known figure in the Crusades, and it's noticeable that he doesn't react to more things in the game. Number 19 is the Swarm Clones. When you become a Swarm, you are able to make clones of yourself based upon how many people your Swarm has devoured. At Mythic Level 8, you can only have one clone, but by Mythic Level 10, you can have a full squad of clones. These clones never speak, and there is no game world reactivity to them. They also come with no items, so you are stuck trying to outfit them with gear very late in the game. The advantage of having them is that they are all perfect copies of your exact build. Bananas. The swarm already has powerful mechanics by itself, so combining it with perfect copies of well-developed builds can be absolutely devastating and very entertaining. Number 18 is Char, another Lich Party member that you can recruit in Act 3. Like the other Lich Party members, he never speaks and has little reactivity in the game. Unlike the other Lich Party members, he is a Cavalier, which is a very fun class to play, and it's very different from what you have access to with other party members. His feat choices make sense for the most part, and he uses a long sword, which allows him to wield a fully upgraded evil radiance. All of this makes him a lot of fun to use. Number 17 is Finian, the talking weapon. He has no camp dialogue and rarely reacts to ongoing conversations. He does have a personal quest along with a few conversations you can have with him. The resolution of his personal quest has multiple endings, some of which are locked behind specific mythic paths or alignments. Since he can turn into any weapon, he's potentially a lifesaver in the early game when you need every edge you can get. Unfortunately, by Act 3, he is quickly outclassed by other weapons you find or create, and in most playthroughs, I never pick him up again. Number 16 is Kestiglir, the last of the Lich Party members. He cannot be recruited until Act 4, and he won't join your party until Act 5. By far, he has the best build out of all your potential undead party members. He is a pure fighter, and when you respect him, for some reason, you can go all the way back to level 4 giving you a huge amount of flexibility when deciding how to build him up. Based on his initial feats, it's clear he's meant to dual wield scimitars, which is a very fun foundation to play with. Outside of this, he has two entertaining conversations you can engage in before recruiting him. While he does suffer from the same lack of reactivity as other Lich Party members, he has a personal quest in Act 5 that is actually pretty great. It tells you more about his past, develops him as a character, and allows the Lich to make a choice about how it should be handled. On top of all that, the quest gives him a fantastic weapon that he has a personal connection with and fits in perfectly with his build. All of that makes him the best Lich party member. Since we've gone through all the Lich party members, let me make a quick note. Seeing their low rankings might have you feeling reserved about choosing Lich as your mythic path. Ranking each of them separately does it really give you an idea of what it's like to run around as a master of the undead with a fully undead party, most of whom you killed personally and revived into enslavement against their will? Lich is fantastic, but it is a very particular kind of role-playing experience. Moving on, number 15 is the romance version of Queen Galfrey. If you play as an Aeon or an Angel and make the correct choices throughout your journey, Queen Galfrey will join your party right before you enter Threshold. Unfortunately, this means you only have her as a party member for around an hour or so. Despite this, I rank her higher because recruiting her is an extremely satisfying end to a romance, which is actually pretty decent. She is a pure paladin, which honestly caught me off guard because I was expecting her to have some sort of unique class. She also comes with rather mediocre items, so you better be prepared to upgrade her. Despite all this, it's an absolute blast finishing the game with Queen Galfrey herself at your side, and the unique indie slide is pretty cool as well. I am going to replay Angel after the Enhanced Edition comes out, 
just to make sure I have a playthrough where Queen Galfrey has ascended. Number 14 is Soseo's brother, Trevor. He has an absolutely terrible hodgepodge build that, like Stoughton, reflects someone who has made awful life choices. Recruiting him requires you to successfully complete Soseo's quest in Act 4 by making a series of arbitrary dialogue choices throughout the game. This makes him very easy to miss, which makes it all the more satisfying if you are able to recruit him. He also has a lot of reactivity in the world, dialogue at camp with party members, and you can have a couple of conversations with him. I wouldn't say he has an equal amount of Act 5 content compared to your base party members, but he's pretty cool to have. Number 13 is Greyboard. To be honest, I don't think my thoughts on him have changed much from the original video. I don't particularly care for his Slayer build since he seems vulnerable on the front lines. His voice actor is great and I think his overall personality is pretty cool, but the chill dad vibe doesn't appeal to me as much compared to the other options available. He has a couple of really cool quests and plenty of world reactivity. Greyboard also provides great dialogue during crusade management sequences, showcasing the mind mindset of a veteran cutthroat mercenary. All that being said, he's a little too vanilla for me so he ranks lower in the list. Number 12 is Lan. He has a very distinctive character model that is half lizard and half human. His crusade management dialogue is fantastic, showing him as hyper focused on the common man but also strongly believing in people making the most out of scarce resources. Lan also has a lot of reactivity to what's happening in the game and plenty of banter with your party. His monk zen archer class is fine but doesn't fit his character at all, making it stand out in an annoying way. His romance is also mediocre and rather sappy compared to other options you have. Mind you, there are people who will absolutely love that, it's just not for me. Finally, while he does have a couple of cool personal quests, I don't really feel like he has a character arc. He becomes at peace with things that were painful, but doesn't really change. I prefer to see stronger character development in my party members. Number 11 is Arushale, everybody's favorite waifu. Her romance is especially fantastic if you are playing as a Zada. I believe she has the most reactivity to a mythic path out of all your party members, and she definitely has the most reactivity to your deity choice if you choose Desna. Her personal quests are also entertaining and do a lot to develop her personality. The problem is her viability for me drops considerably if I am not playing a Zada and or worshipping Desna. While I do enjoy her romance, I am not really a fan of her personality in general dialogues. The quiet, reserved, and sometimes almost timid way she approaches conversations just doesn't work for me. I am also not a fan of her class, which is Espionage Expert, a subclass of Ranger. Rangers specialize in the favorite enemy mechanic, which has been nerfed in Wrath of the Righteous. Instead of one demon category, there are now three, which all pretty much have equal weight in the game. Consequently, her build is not as effective as it could be, but she's still a great archer with some nice spells to boot, such as Bark Skin. She also gets a ton of skill points, making it easy to fill some gaps you might have. My final issue with Arushale is there is no way to maintain a real relationship with the evil version of her. This to me is a terrible choice, especially in light of Monago being able to find true love if you play as Azada. The demon should absolutely be able to turn Arushale back to being evil and then start a crazy chaotic love affair. Forcing me to kill her evil version in the ending slides no less just doesn't make sense. Number 10 is Regil, and trust me, it hurts not to put him higher. He's got a fabulous character model, an old, stern, wrinkled, known face, coupled with flowing bright white and purple hair. He also has a solid Hell Knight build, an entertaining personality, one of the most distinctive voices in the game, and his banter with other party members can be hilarious. His dialogue is superb, whether you are exploring or engaged in crusade management meetings where he repeatedly has Sela clutching her pearls in horror at his ruthlessness. The problem is the game doesn't give him enough love. There is no character arc for him. He has a couple of quests, but I wouldn't call them personal, and one of them does very little to develop his personality. I also find it very off-putting how easy it is to gain his trust. In Act 5, you can literally 
openly be a demon and still gain him as an ally in a manner that's no different from any other mythic path. It is nice that he has some degree of reactivity to you being a devil, but I still think he needs more content in the game. Number 9 is Darren, someone who is always hilarious to have in your group. He has a great oracle build that allows him to be your healer, buffer, and he could do pretty decent damage. He has great dialogue with other party members that is equal parts funny and revealing. His romance is also pretty solid and allows you to learn more about his character. He has a personal quest that makes him very mysterious and this mystery is left unresolved for most of the game. The issue I have with Darren is that the resolution of his personal quest is pretty terrible and it mars the character overall. Forcing the player to kill Hawkblade to keep Darren out of prison just doesn't make much sense and the drama feels forced. Consequently, it's hard to justify keeping Darren if you aren't doing an evil run, but even if you are doing a good run, letting him be carried off the jail feels like a betrayal. All this unnecessary complication causes me to rarely use him. Number 8 is Soseo. We've already talked about his quest, which I thoroughly enjoy, even though I believe completing it in a good way is harder than it should be. I really like how the resolution of that quest has a profound effect on Soseo, and that is reflected in his ending slides. He has a very nice empathetic voice that pairs perfectly with his character and the dialogue he is given. Soseo also has a ton of reactivity to what's happening in the world, and while I don't find his banter with party members particularly impressive, there is a lot of it. His starting cleric build is mediocre, and unfortunately making him into a standout party member in combat kind of requires you to make choices that are outside of his character, such as picking up domains that aren't provided by Shellen. His romance is also pretty mediocre, focusing around him being inexperienced, but not providing the type of character insights you get from Windowog or Arushale. Despite all of this, your party member choices for a great healer really come down to Darren or Soseo, and I always find myself leaning towards Soseo. Number 7 is Wojif, someone who is always entertaining to have around. He's got a fun voice that is paired with dialogue appropriate for a complete scoundrel who is always out for himself. His personal quest is pretty cool and you can significantly impact his personality based on its resolution. The way the voice actor handles whether you are dealing with evil or neutral Wolgif is actually really cool to me. He has hilarious dialogue with several other party members and the professional criminal perspective he brings to the crusade management problems is oftentimes funny as well. His rogue Eldritch Scoundrel build is also great, with some flexibility to multi-class into something like Arcane Trickster if you like. He can be a two-handed dagger-wielding frontline fighter, or a blaster from the back lines depending on your preference. He also gets a ton of skill points, helping to fill critical gaps on your team. The problem I have with Wolgif is I feel his character doesn't go far enough. He's a scoundrel who abandons you, but even evil Wolgif will never flat out betray you or do something that your character might see as particularly egregious. By that same token, neutral Wolgif never becomes a heroic figure. He's always kind of a middle of the road character, and I think that hurts his character arc to some degree. I also think it's weird that he's not a romance option, despite commenting on being attracted to some party members. Balancing out Wolgif not going far enough is another party member who takes things to the extreme. Number 6 is Camellia and man oh man is this chick back crack crazy. Her personal quest is fantastic even though it is very predictable. I love how firmly evil she is and how you really don't have much room to convince her to be another way. I am not a fan of her voice but I do agree it makes sense for her character. Her romance is not only entertaining, but there's also variety in it, ranging from you two being close but not truly trusting each other, to her considering you a flat out soulmate. Her Shaman Spirit Hunter build is also fantastic, even if it is difficult to get the hang of. She makes a great tank and easily stacks AC compared to your other party members, while maintaining a fantastic list of useful spells. She has a voice that I don't care for, but it does fit her character well. My main problem with Camellia is that she only works in neutral or evil parties. It's very difficult to justify letting her stick around if you are one of the good guys. Number 5 is Avu, and honestly no one is more surprised than me that a party member outside the base options is ranked this high. You can only get access to Avu if you play as an Azada, but she'll join your party immediately upon reaching Mythic Rank 3. 
She's fantastic in a lot of ways, starting with the staggering amount of dialogue she receives. Abu just cannot stop talking, especially if you are discussing something Mythic Path or Dragon related. She also has unique dialogue scenes for mythic paths you might switch to, such as Golden Dragon or Swarm. I seriously believe she's top 5 on this list as far as lines of dialogue in the game. Avu has a fun and adorable personality that fits in perfectly with the Azada vibe. Her personal quest is a great time and has one of the most shocking moments you can experience in the game. Right from the start, her class is great as she's a Havoc Dragon who gets a breath attack that can hit multiple enemies for 2d10 sonic damage per your mythic rank. That means you can always do solid damage with her, even against enemies that have crazy high AC or spell resistance. Over time, Anvil gets a level 9 cleric spellbook, which means she has access to fantastic powers like heal, holy aura, and restoration greater. She gets a toggle that lets her attempt to intimidate all enemies within 30 feet, and she can use the spell magic greater with a caster level that caps at 20, just like Ember or Nanio, making her a very powerful debuffer. She's also a very reliable tank with a natural armor enhancement bonus that lets her stand right on the front lines as long as she's buffed properly. Finally, as you increase in mythic rank, she gets larger until she is a full-blown dragon, allowing you to mount her. Avu provides your only opportunity in the game to mount a dragon while raining down fire spells or chopping away at your enemies, and it's as awesome as it sounds. Unfortunately, there are two problems holding her back. First, Abu has zero voice acting. Even the Lich party members speak once or twice, but she is completely mute the entire game. Second, she has no character development whatsoever. The game quickly establishes that she is a child, and while her body grows over time, her mind is essentially still the same, and consequently, she experiences no personal growth. Like I said, she has a great fun personality, but it's definitely weird considering how long the game is that she never changes at all. Number 4 is Sela, a signature character in the Pathfinder mythos and clearly one of my favorite party members in the game. She has a fantastic voice paired with dialogue that makes Sela a fun lawful character, which is very rare. Her personal growth over the course of the game can be influenced by you and the conversations where she reveals in her struggles are very endearing. She also has a ton of reactivity to what's happening in the game. Her interactions with party members aren't as hilarious as Darren or Wolgif, but they are still very entertaining and I look forward to those conversations. Her personal quest is also very solid and provides additional character growth. She has a lot of crusade management dialogue, but I honestly found it pretty typical of a lawful good character and don't think it stands out like Greybor or Rejil. I also find it very odd that she's not a romance option. In my original party ranking video, multiple subscribers commented that this is probably because she is a canon character and Pazzo wouldn't allow a romance. That reasoning doesn't make sense to me because you can kill Sela if you play a swarm. If I can kill her, why can't I romance her? My other issue with Sela is she doesn't stand on principle the way I feel her character should. There are multiple sequences in the game where she doesn't stop you from committing evil acts and honestly, you don't have to worry about losing her until officially choosing an evil deity in Act 5. The fact that you can literally kill one of Iomade's angels right in front of her with not even a whisper of dissent is particularly jarring. Even if she leaves due to you picking an evil mythic path, she just goes wandering off on her own as opposed to joining Galfrey and helping the resistance as her character clearly should. Overall, I like Sila a lot, but I think a few changes should have been made so that her character is more consistent. Quick note before we get into my top 3 companions, if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate you hitting the like button. This information tells me which content the channel is enjoying and helps my videos spread to more people. I really appreciate all of the support. Alright, let's hit my top 3 party members starting with Ember at number 3. She has a childlike voice that I personally do not like, but it is perfect for her character. Her dialogue is also fantastic, and in my opinion she has the best banter with your other party members. Regardless of who she is paired with, there are really deep moments that make other party members and you sit back to reflect. 
She also has a great personal quest, whose resolution you can change based on dialogues with her throughout the game. Those dialogues can also influence her impact on Nocticula, turning her into the Redeemer Queen. Her stigmatized witch class is also fantastic. Her curse is blackened, which means she will automatically get fire spells as she levels up. Fire is by far the most powerful element in the game since there are a lot of items that can increase its potency. Without your mythic path, it would be difficult to create a more powerful blaster than what Ember is capable of. She gets to choose a hex every other level, which makes her a powerful buffer and debuffer for your party. Her access to a suite of healing spells makes her a nice backup healer in a pinch as well. My only issue with Ember is I don't like her voice because I don't like having a child as a party member. I know that she's not actually a teenager, but in both face and voice, she's clearly a youth. Traveling with her reminds me of playing KOTOR with Mission Vial, and I hated that just as much. Number two on the list is Nanio, who in my opinion is your best crowd control party member in the game. There is a fantastic suite of spells in the Illusion School, and nobody in your party uses them better than her. She can shut down an entire group of enemies with Phantasmal Putrefaction, or wipe them out in one turn with Weird. Her Wizard Scroll Savant class makes her extremely effective with scrolls, and she gets a full level 9 spellbook. Nanio has a great, instantly memorable voice that is paired with a well-developed, inquisitive personality. She is by far the funniest party member you receive, with multiple great dialogues with the player character, party members, and other NPCs. Over a year later, her initial dialogue with Baphomet is still the most laugh out loud funniest interaction in the game. Initially, our personal quest is just okay, but the resolution of it is standout in an intense way and deeply impacts her character. I am not a fan at all of the huge puzzle you have to get through to resolve it, but mods let me bypass that, so it doesn't bother me anymore. The only real drawback to Nanio is that you cannot romance her, but it's hard for me to even be mad at that because she is so obviously a woman who is married to a work. If she was romanceable though, she'd probably be at the top of this list. That being said, there can only be one top dog and no surprise, Winduog has figured out how to beat the competition. First and foremost, she has the most distinctive voice in the game. Somehow it sounds gravelly and almost masculine, while also sometimes sounding soft and vulnerable. Absolutely fantastic voice work. Her dialogue is also superb, showcasing a woman who is desperate for the power that will make her independent, but clueless about how to get it. Windowalk's romance is also the best in the game, requiring you to see through her deceptions multiple times to achieve a soulmate status. Even though she doesn't get as much unique dialogue, romancing her while playing a demon mythic path fits like a glove and feels just as good as Azada paired with the Ruchelet. She equally matches your viciousness every step of the way. Matching her unique voice is a character model that is also instantly recognizable. Blue, heavily scarred skin is stretched across dangling creepy spider legs attached to a lithe female frame and topped off with yellow glowing cat eyes. Alluring, dangerous, captivating, and unnerving all at the same time. Her personal quest is also great, slowly allowing you to unravel her layers and revealing the motivations behind such a devious personality. She starts with one rank in the fighter class, and frankly, I am not a fan of this. Most of the other party members get classes that reflect their personalities, so it's not clear why she gets something so bland. Regardless, you can easily shift her to something else as long as it focuses on dexterity. She is clearly meant to be an archer, and that's how I've always used her, but I have many subscribers who swear by switching her to throwing axes instead. No matter what you choose, she will absolutely carve up your foes. Also, even though her personality is strongly evil and Windowog has done some terrible things, she's not running around eating your crusaders like Camellia, so I feel that good aligned commanders can keep her if you wanted to. If I was to mention one drawback, it's that her romance doesn't stay true enough to who she is. You basically have to soften up and create a lovey-dovey equal partnership situation. 
That's not the type of relationship most demons have. She wants power and knows that staying in close proximity to my demon will give her that power. Why does my demon have to pretend he sees her as an equal? I feel like the game should have allowed for a more evil type of romance, similar to what you get if you have a relationship with Nocticula. It's still a great ride, but I do think with a little tweaking, it could have been more. That wraps up my personal rankings for all the potential party members in the game. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a like, share this content, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.